We normally know the story of the Daniel and the lion's den. I'll be flipping on you. The lions and Daniel's den. We don't understand the story. This ain't about the lions at all, y'all. This is about Daniel. In our lives, we understand faith and fear, right? Because most of us live all our lives in fear. We're afraid of life and living. We're afraid of death and dying. We're afraid of what might happen, could happen, should happen, whatever. And so because of the fear that we have, most of it unrealized, you know, and that's why the Bible says so much about worry and anxiety. If I was to walk through, and I'm not because we don't have the kind of time, but I'm sure you would help me. If I were to ask you, what are you scared of or what are you anxious about, you would probably tell me something that might happen. Might happen. Not that has happened, not that this happened, not that it might. And we sit here and we worry and we worry and we worry. We get all fretful and, and, and fearful. And those things never occur. And so the devil wins the victory in our lives all the time because you and I have a choice. We live by faith or we live by fear. You might say, Brother Lynn, is there an example in the scriptures of somebody that lived by faith? I'm glad you asked. There is a man by the name of Daniel. And we say, if I might quote another part of the Bible, it talks about a lot of drop that we can make the application to Daniel 2. Daniel is a man just like you and I. Do you hear me? Daniel is a man just like you and I. He was born, he lived, he died. There is nothing about him that was a super person. He didn't have any special superpowers. He was a human being just like you, just like me, just like others, just like us. But he had one thing uncommon, and if you would, supernatural, and that is he believed in God. Do you? You say, Brother Lynn, I believe in God. Really? How much do you believe in God? Do you believe in God in the conversation about Him? And is that as far as it goes? Or do you really believe in God? Do you really believe that God can answer prayer? Do you? Do you really believe that God can perform miracles? Do you? Do you really believe that God loves you? Do you really believe that God can forgive you? Do you really believe that God has a plan and purpose for your life? Do you believe that? Because, see, if you don't believe that God has a plan and purpose, what's the point? If you don't believe that God is who God claims to be, what's the point? And so over the last few weeks, we have talked about Daniel. Daniel, may I remind you? We talked about faith in the fiery furnace. And we're, we, we looked at the story with the three Hebrew children. Where did they get that from? Daniel was not a part of that. I got it. But if I'm not mistaken, those three Hebrews, those young men, they needed a role model. And Daniel was that role model. When Daniel stood and said, I will not eat at the king's table. I will not eat at the king's food. And I need you to trust me as I trust my God. Well, because Daniel had favor with that chamber person, that unit over the uh, captive people, that unit told Daniel, you better be right, brother, because if you're not, I'm going to get, it's going to be my head, not your head, the rose. And he trusted Daniel as Daniel trusted God, and God will never prove you to be a liar. And Daniel fared better than the rest of them. In fact, Daniel and these other three young men. Why? Because Daniel stood up, and Daniel stood out, and Daniel stood on faith and faith alone. Daniel didn't ask for consensus. Daniel didn't ask for a raising of the hand. Daniel said, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to trust my God. Now, we can have an argument. Why? I mean, our God let us down. You, you and I say, we've had bad days. We've not, we have not yet had a day like they did. Not a day near like they had. They lost their home. They lost their families. They lost their king. They lost their army. They lost their city. They lost their temple. They lost everything that identified them. Everything that gave them something to clean. They lost everything. And now they're in a captive in a foreign land and they're prisoners of war. And yet even in that miserable condition, Daniel said, I haven't forgotten God because God hasn't forgiven, hasn't forgotten me. And I will stand and trust my God to my dying breath and my dying day. God honors that. And because he stood as a role model, those three young men stood and they saw Daniel take a stand. And when they saw him take a stand, it gave them courage to stand with him. And as they did that, God blessed all of them. And when they stood that day when everybody else bent the knee and bowed the head except them, they did that because they were standing on Daniel's shoulders, if you 
would do it as Daniel had taught and encouraged them to do. And God honored their faith. And when God honored their faith, they were set free in the midst of the fire and furnace. I reminded you, sometimes you've got to go through the fire to be set free. Amen? Sometimes you go through the battle. And I remind you, you don't know what grace is until you need it. You don't need dying grace until you're dying. You don't need living, living grace until you're trying to live. You don't need strength until you need it. You don't need that. You don't need that stuff of a mountaintop. You need it day by day in the valleys. And so in the valleys of our lives, God has never disappointed us, has he? God has never lied to us. God has never disappointed us. And they were set free in the midst of the fiery furnace. We said also that, that not only faith in the fiery furnace, but you didn't see that coming. When Nebuchadnezzar shook his puny fist in the face of God and told God, no, you didn't do nothing, brother. I did it all. A watcher, an angel said, no, brother, you don't understand. Everything that you got, God gave you. Can I remind you? You ain't done a thing. Every breath you take is given to you as a gift of Almighty God. If you've got strength, God gave you that body. If you've got a mind, it's a mental acuity. God gave you that mind and ability. God has given every opportunity. God has given strength. God has given us everything we have and everything we ever, we ever hoped of. God has done it all. Now, yes, you can claim credit if you want to, if you are on shaky ground when you do. And so Daniel said, God forbid you, you should say that, King. God forbid you should do that. You haven't done a thing. And when we think that we are the masters of our own destiny, we are on shaky, tenuous ground. And so God struck him down and he lived like a wild animal for seven years. But he didn't see that coming. But not only did he strike him down, after seven years, God raised him up. God gave him back his, his sanity. God gave him back his kingdom. God restored him and God gave favor to him. And you know why? Because in that broken, miserable condition, Nebuchadnezzar looked up and he glorified God and said, I was wrong. Y'all listen to me well. Now, if you need to be taken to the woodshed, God can do that. But whatever it is that God needs to do to get your attention, my attention and our attention, trust me when I say, God can do that. I'm not saying God will. I'm not saying and I don't hear what I'm not saying. God doesn't vindictively do anything. God doesn't send cancer to whip people. God doesn't send tragedy to hurt. God can do that kind of stuff. That's not my God. But I am saying this. If we live in rebellion, there's a payday coming. If we live in an open rebellion, in an open, open rebellion, I promise you there's a payday coming. It ain't always on Friday. And so Nebuchadnezzar was brought down. Nebuchadnezzar came back. Last week we said this. The hand right on the wall. When Nebuchadnezzar, after he came to Jesus and glorified God, he lived the rest of his days serving and worshiping God Almighty. That's his personal testimony. But when he died, his kingdom went back in the darkness because they could not fathom that Nebuchadnezzar could really be a follower of the Most High God. He was. And when his grandson took the throne and his daddy did, his son and grandson took the throne, it plunged that kingdom back into despair, into darkness. And when God wrote on the wall, on the place of that wall, me, 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 that your, your kingdom has been found lacking, you've been weighed, and you've come up short, and this night your kingdom will be taken from you. Let me make sure that you hear me. The plaster was still on the floor when the Mede and the Persian army came into that palace Paul and kill Belshazzar and those thousand lords and other Babylonian officials. That town was five miles square. The town proper was 3,000 plus acres. The wall itself, the foundations they found, is five miles square. And so when they came into the city, they were still having themselves a high old time. But when they knocked on the palace wall, it's too late. Now hear me. When Darius, the Mede, and the Persian Mede army stormed that palace hall and murdered Belshazzar and the rest of them. The writing is still on the wall, y'all. The writing is still there. And Daniel's still standing there. And when they came in there and killed the rest of them, God protected him and God kept him alive because God still has a plan and purpose for him. We pick it up today. Let me share it with you in Daniel chapter 6. His message to us, the line in Daniel's pen. 
So the king gave an order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with, a, with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. The king returned to his palace and spent the whole night without eating, without entertainment being brought to him. He could not sleep. But at the first light of dawn, the, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near to the den, he called out to Daniel in an agonized voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, note that, the living God, has your God whom you serve continually, has he been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel replied, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The kings commanded the men who had falsely accused Daniel. They were brought in, thrown into the lion's den with their wives and children. And before they reached before the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language, upon all the earth. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and mighty wonders in the heavens and upon the earth. He rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. The word of God, the people of God, thanks be to God. Amen. Listen to that his story. As he's standing there, as he's standing there, and the blood of all those officials are covering that marble floor of that great imperial palace, Darius and his army see this cat, Daniel, standing up there. Now, I don't know, but my guess would be this. He's just walked over there. He's, he's just walked on the, by the wall. He just told the king what was written on the wall. And so my guess is Daniel was probably still in that hall and probably still nearby that wall. And that writing still applies not just to the Babylonians, but also to the Medes and Persians. Because these guys go charging in there, and it's going to be the same song, second sorry verse. And so Daniel has sense enough to realize, here we go again. And so the Babylonian Empire is, is waning. It's, it's gone. And this new guy is coming on the scene. Do you know that God is sovereign? Do you hear me? Do you know that, God, that Daniel stood there that day? And Daniel could have been just like us. I cannot believe this. I cannot believe it. I'm 80-something years old, man. Give me a break. I mean, I'm 80-something years old. What more can I do? What more do you want? What more do you ask? Give me a break. But did he do that? No. You know why he didn't do that? Daniel knew that that army was God's plan. Daniel knew that that was God's plan and God's purpose for them and for him. Daniel didn't know what tomorrow held, but he knew that God had a plan and a purpose because God is sovereign. God, good and bad, that comes into our life. Do you believe that God sits on the throne? Come on, y'all. Do you believe that God sits on the throne? Do you believe He's all powerful? Do you believe He knows everything? Do you believe that He doesn't manipulate us like a, a, a puppet master? He gives us free will and He gives us an opportunity and He gives us options and He gives us choices. <coughs> they made the wrong choice. Daniel made the right choice. Amen? And so Daniel stands there and the king, and I believe that God gives favor. Do you? Come on now, do you? If you don't, bless God and read the Bible. I believe that God can bless us because God gives us favor in the sight of the world. I believe that. I believe when I hit my knees and I bow my head and I ask God to help me when I go for a job interview, I believe God does that. Do you? I believe that when I stand before people and I ask God to give me favor, I believe that God will give me favor. Do you? 
everything I say and everything I do in any place that I go, before I walk in that door, I ask God to go before I get there. Amen? And if I believe that, and I believe that God is here, and I believe that God goes before me, I believe that God has a plan, and I believe that God has a purpose, and I believe that God is sovereign over all things. Do you? Daniel did. And still, Daniel wasn't fearful. Daniel wasn't fretful. Daniel wasn't anxious. Daniel knew that God was in control. Daniel knew that although this was bad, there must be a plan behind what was going on. And here the guy is, and here the army is, and undoubtedly Babylon's days are gone, and undoubtedly this new kingdom is going to rule over him. So let's just see where the ride takes us. And so as Darius the king saw Daniel and understood because of the royal accoutrements, the bling bling, that he was somebody, Darius had the good sense by God's grace to figure out who he was and what he was. Daniel had been in the kingdom over 60 years. He had been in politics over 50 years. And so Daniel was already the third in line of the kingdom of Babylon. And Darius had the good sense to understand that Daniel was an asset, not a liability. Does that make sense? Can I help you? Wherever you work, be an asset, not a liability. Keep your mouth to your shape, keep your mouth shut, put your nose to the, to the wheel, and work. Amen? Because I, I want you to hear it. If all you can do is run your mouth, you're making a blight on God. If you claim Kobe, United Methodist Church, or any other church as your church, and God is your job, and God, when you get out there and all you can do is bellyache and complain, moan, groan, and just all that kind of junk, you realize you're putting a bad blight on Him. Do you realize you're giving him a bad name? Because if people look at us and they say this, you're a Christian in mouth. If we're a Christian in mouth only, it doesn't help a whole lot. But if we're a Christian through and through, if on the worst days of our life we can still glorify God, that's powerful, amen? If everything in life goes sideways and we can stand in the midst of our brokenness and woundedness and the shards of our broken dreams and we can still glorify God, that's a good thing, isn't it? And so there Daniel is. And Daniel, Darius sees something about Daniel that he's never seen before. And as Darius takes Daniel and he moves him into political arena as an asset, not a liability, he makes him third in the kingdom under King Cyrus the king of the Persians. Darius, the Mede, was under Cyrus over Babylon, and he made Daniel next in line to him. Why? Because Daniel had an excellent spirit. Spirit. Come on, man. Daniel had an excellent spirit. Daniel was a good man. Daniel was a godly man. Daniel was a spiritual man. Daniel was a right and righteous man. And Darius knew that. He conducted himself as a man of God. He did the right and righteous thing all the time. You know what happens, right? These petty politicians, they saw Daniel and they got jealous. They saw Daniel and they got enraged because these petty politicians, they didn't want to do the right and righteous thing. They wanted power. They wanted authority. They wanted prestige. They wanted the name. They wanted all this stuff. And they would do anything to anybody that stood in their way. And so the Bible says, if you'll read chapter 6, that these men did everything they could to find some accusation against Daniel, but they couldn't. God help us to have that. Amen? I would give anything in my... I would give anything to have the reputation that the whole world could be looking for something bad on me and in me and around me and about me and couldn't touch me, wouldn't you? Hey Amen. I got all kinds of things you can, you can find wrong with. Amen. I got a hard head and a big mouth and an attitude for a little guy. You know. And so uh, there's always something. But with Daniel, man, Daniel was true. You know. Daniel was spiritual. Daniel was true. Daniel was right and Daniel was righteous. And Daniel always did the right thing at the right time for the right reason. God help us to have more men like this. And it infuriated them and it enraged them. And so they came up with a great, a great plan. They said to Darius' ego, you the man. So I tell you what let's do. 
One of, because everybody's in agreement. Let's make a rule that nobody can pray to any other God than your God. Your God. For 30 days. Oh, 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 and by the way, if there's some fool, if there's some rebellious fool out there that would dream and dare not to bow and acknowledge your God, let's throw them in a den of lions. And let, let's, let's make a spectacle of them. And let's make sure that everybody knows that your gods are the bad gods and the big gods and all this kind of stuff. You know why they did that, right? Because they knew Daniel, unknowing about this plot, they knew Daniel would pray. They made you read the scriptures. It says that when Daniel heard about this law, Daniel went back to his room, opened up his doors so that everybody could see him as his habit was, and Daniel got on his knees and Daniel lifted up his head and Daniel's face turned towards, turned towards the heavens and Jerusalem and he prayed. Just like he always said. We think so. When things go sideways, what do you do? Throw rocks or pray. Amen? What do you do? Do you throw your hands up in despair and ring and, and run around and say, Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Or do you fall on your knees and do I fall on my knees and do we fall on our knees and do we pray? Daniel, it seems, had a habit. And it seems that habit was one that he did all his life. He hit his knees and he looked up at God and he said, God help me. Amen. And so as Daniel is praying, as Daniel is worshiping, as Daniel humbles himself in the sight of God and man, He's also making a point. You see, Daniel wasn't stupid. Daniel had been through the, the wars before. And Daniel believed God. Again, we live by faith or we live by fear. fear. You choose. Don't you think? He's not, it's not just he's an old senile man, is it? That Daniel believed. I know he passed a law. And I know I may lose my life. But I'm telling you straight up. That I will die on my feet as a child of God, not groveling in the dirt like a dog. And so Daniel made his mind up, faith, not fear, hit his knees, bowed his head, and said, God help me. When they saw that, they ran to the king, and the king, because they could not be revoked, amended, or redone, they had Darius, and Darius knew he'd been played. Have you ever been played? Y'all help me. Have been played? You like being played? I don't like being played. I don't like being played for a sucker or played for a fool. Darius didn't either, but he had, he had done this thing and he couldn't undo it. So you know what he says? We just read it. As Daniel was brought before the king, the king, Darius, looked at Daniel. And because of Daniel's life and lifestyle, Darius said this, You're God whom you faithfully serve, he will protect you. He wasn't asking the question, y'all. He's making a statement. Is there anybody in the world around you that when life goes sideways can look at you and say, I know this is bad, but I know the God whom you faithfully serve, the God who you proclaim, the God who you worship, the God whom you serve, the God to whom you pray, I believe in that God because I've seen your life. I believe in that God because I've seen how you operate in stressful, broken. I believe in your God because of the life that you live. Darius stood there and he says, I believe. And so not may God help your sorry soul, but may the God whom you serve, may he protect you. And threw it to the line then. Now that's not some great big circus act. It's a great big pit in the ground. And they threw him over in that thing. And you can watch it. Lions couldn't jump out, but you can watch the spectacle. When Daniel hit the, hit the, the dirt in the bottom of that pit, Daniel stands up there and he says, do what you got to do, brother. And they closed that pit in. Darius went and spent the whole night praying if he would. The next morning at the break of day, Darius runs out there and he asks a probing question. He says, Daniel, servant of the living God. Do you know why he said that? See, Darius knew that he served a dead God. Amen? 
Darius knew that he served a God of wood and a God of stone and a God of silver and a God of gold. That God didn't speak. That God couldn't reach. That God couldn't, that God couldn't do anything. But he had seen Daniel. He had watched him. He had seen him. And he knew that his God was different than any other God he'd ever seen. And so Daniel, servant of the Most High God, servant of the living God, could your God save you? Did your God save you? Daniel says, yeah, buddy. Ah, yeah, buddy. Let me tell you something. King got happy. Daniel did too. They drug Daniel out of the lion's den. Daniel, just like the three Hebrew children, stood there, no mark on him, no sign on him, to the glory of God above. Amen. Let me tell you something. Have you been through the wars? Have y'all been through the wars? Most of us, when we go through the wars, we stink. We got blood all over us. We got we got bobos all over us. We got the smell of the stench of death on us, the stench of fear on us. We stand there and we have been beat up, beat on, and we are a wreck. But Daniel stands there, and as Daniel stands there, God, they can see the power of God. They can see the power of God on Daniel. And then they turned and they, those that maliciously accused Daniel were thrown to the pit and there they had it. So, what does all that mean? If all this is true and it does, what, what lessons might we learn? The one that I have is sharing with you now. You realize that suffering is sometimes necessary to glorify God? Do you think that Daniel said, hey, hey, I'd like to suffer. Lord save me, I'd love to suffer. I don't know of any fool yet that stands there and begs God to suffer. Amen? But do you realize that sometimes suffering is necessary to glorify God? Do you realize that God can't heal you unless you get sick? Amen? Amen? God can't heal you unless you get sick. God can't heal you until you've been broken. God can't heal you until you've been wounded. God can't heal you until you've been in the valley. God can't heal you until you need healing. God can't help you until you need help. So if it's always on the mountaintop, who cares? On the mountaintop, anybody can praise God. On the mountaintop, anybody can sing glory to God. On the mountaintop, anybody can lift up and pray and praise and worship. Anybody can. But it's in the valley when we find power. It's in the valley when we find peace. And it's in the valley when we find the promises and the provisions of God and the power of God. And so sometimes suffering is necessary so that God can be manifested and God can be glorified. God's judgment may seem slow, but God's judgments are always certain. And deliverance is always impressive no matter who and how God does it. God will do anything and God will do everything to show to us and to others that He is the Lord God Almighty. He's the Alpha, He's the Omega, He's the beginning, He's the end, He's the first, He's the last. He is God Almighty. Never underestimate the power of faith in the godly life. We may not ever receive what we deserve from people, but we will always deserve, we will always receive the best of God. Amen. When we're treated falsely, trust God to deliver us. When we're treated unjustly, wait for God to vindicate us. When we're dealt with unfairly, allow God to repay. When we suffer undeservedly, allow God to make Himself known to you and to others. Amen. You feel like you're in the lion's den? See? You feel like you're being beat up on by the world? You feel like you're being treated unfairly? You feel like God doesn't care about you and God doesn't love you and all that kind of stuff? But I'll remind you that when you feel your worst, God can be at His best. Amen. God can help you. When you're down and you can't get up, why don't you lift up your head and your hand and see if God can't help you. Amen. Because I promise you, if you think you can handle it, God, let's try it. And when you lose everything you've got, including your hope, and you finally, in the midst of your brokenness and woundedness, when you finally realize you ain't as bad as you thought you were, or we think we are, and we get to the point that we've tried everything else, let's try Jesus, and, and we, can, we humble ourselves, and we admit our needs, and we lift our eyes, and we look up and we reach out for the hand of God, may I help you? Before you reach up, God's already reaching down. Amen?